Daniel stared out in absolute slack-jawed amazement. Alan? he said. The pale man bowed elegantly. The one and only. What the hell are you doing here? Proving a point, Alan answered. Also, you can't go home. Brian was staring between the two of them. What the fuck? he muttered. And you must be the brain! Alan cried, grinning. Pleasure to meet you. Sorry you had to get caught up in all this. I know how you coders just hate adventure. Wait, whoa, hang on a second, Daniel said. He felt nauseous. This didn't happen in real life. What do you mean I can't go home? Alan rolled his eyes. I mean you can't go home, dummy. Well, why the hell not? Uh, <laughs> duh, because someone's trying to kill you. Get out of the elevator, come on. You shouldn't trust those things, they're way too easy to hack. Daniel, who the fuck is this guy? Brian asked, looking from Daniel to Alan and back. Daniel stepped out of the elevator. He's a friend of Minami's, he said. Alan snorted. <laughs> I wouldn't call us friends, he said. But sure, if that's how you want to dumb it down. I know the finer details of social interaction are often lost on you people. He began walking towards the emergency stairs at the other end of the darkened floor. Daniel trailed after him, and Brian trailed after Daniel. Seriously, where are we going? Daniel asked. To a safe house, of a sort, Alan replied. Well, it's a house and you'll be safe. Enough. He reached the door to the stairwell and held it open. After you, gentlemen. I'm really glad you're here for this, Brian, Daniel commented as they descended the bleak concrete stairs. Otherwise, I'd think I was going totally fucking nuts. Dude! I'm not sure I'm not hallucinating, Brian confided. This is fucking bizarre. You're both hallucinating, Alan quipped. You've somehow convinced yourself that the world you live in makes sense. And that, my fine feathered friends, is the biggest hallucination of all. This guy is crazy, Brian grumbled. I prefer the term enlightened, Alan corrected him. He's kind of crazy, Daniel admitted. So why are we going along with him again? Daniel shrugged. Because someone's trying to kill me. Bullshit. You think I fell down the fucking stairs? Daniel snapped. They held a gun to my head, Brian. An honest-to-God gun. They weren't messing around. Brian's eyes went wide. Holy shit, dude. I'm sorry. Daniel shook his head, crossing briskly to the street exit. Forget it. I didn't tell you, you, you couldn't have known. Hold it! Alan cried, just as Daniel was putting his hand on the push bar. You stay behind me, kids. Dylan's waiting outside, but you can never be too careful. He's not actually bulletproof, despite what you might think. Carefully, Alan pushed open the door, not letting a single toe slip past the threshold. All clear? he called. You're goddamn paranoid, a rumbling voice answered from outside. All clear, Alan said to the two coders with a smile and led the way out into the lamplit street. The Hulk was waiting outside for them, his massive arms folded over his barrel chest, eyes glittering like beetles' carapaces. Who's the brunette? The Hulk asked as they emerged. Brian Dillon, Dillon Brian, Alan said, gesturing to each in turn. He's joining us on our little excursion by virtue of being in the elevator when it mysteriously died. 
Fortunately, he and Danny Boy are buddies. It's purple, Brian said vaguely. I told you you were bad with colors. Alan quipped at the Hulk. Now come on, ducklings, time to go roost. He started off while the Hulk stood and watched them. After you, he said, indicating Alan's retreating twig-like form. Daniel started off after Alan, and Brian, apparently lost beyond all hope, trailed after Daniel like smoke from a cigarette. The Hulk padded after them, eerily silent for a man the size of a small building. Where are we going? Daniel asked. And how the hell did you get into the NDC? One, you'll see, Alan said, and two, I tunneled in from underneath. He snorted. With a chip, dummy. You have NDC access? Daniel asked, incredulous. I have many things, Alan said, waving his hands. A big-ass mouth, for one. The Hulk grumbled behind them. He was blotting out streetlights. If possible, he looked twice as big standing up as he ever had sitting down. All the better to kiss you with, my dear. Alan said sweetly. The Hulk chuckled. It sounded something like a landslide. <laughs> Kissing, sure. Alan gasped. Dylan! There are children present! They're married, Daniel explained to Brian, whose eyes were starting to glaze over. He turned back to Alan and said, So, how far is it to this safe house? Not far, Alan said. Maybe an hour by rail. Uh, Daniel said. I I'm not sure where you got your concept of not far, but an hour by rail is, like, outside the city. And he does math. He's a real catch, this one. How'd me ever net a renaissance man like you? I should count myself lucky to be the one taking you home tonight. You live outside the city? His genius is unparalleled. That's illegal, isn't it? Not with the right permits, Alan said. Again, there was the landslide chuckle from the Hulk. Not if they don't catch you, he amended. Details, Alan said. Besides, we're farm holders, remember? I swear, if you forget, we're farm holders again. The hell are we farming? Lichen? Again, Alan pointed out. Details. Details will get you killed. A quote from you. Only if you don't remember them, Alan said. Much easier to make them up on the fly, as long as you can remember them. Here we are. In you go, kitties. He gestured to a rail's entrance, a wide set of stairs diving beneath the concrete walkway. Aren't you coming with us? Daniel asked, concerned. Alan shook his head. A few more things to take care of in town. I'll meet you there later tonight. Don't worry. He ruffled Daniel's hair. Dylan will take good care of you both. Daniel eyed the Hulk warily. Good intentions aside, there was just something automatically disconcerting about a man who could crush your head in one hand. After you, he grumbled, gesturing to the rail's entrance. Reluctantly, Daniel descended the stairs, Brian trailing along behind him. Daniel? Brian asked quietly. What the hell is going on? Daniel shook his head. I'll tell you later, he said. Not out here. Why not? Daniel just shook his head again. Who were those guys? Friends of Minami's, Daniel answered cagily. The thin one is Alan. The mountain with legs is the... Dylan. We call him the Hulk. I can see why, Brian commented faintly. Daniel glanced back as they reached the level one platform. The stairwell behind them was empty. 
Vegas. They wanted some alone time, he said. W wait, you mean they're actually married? Brian said. I thought you were kidding! I don't know if they are or not, Daniel said. It's kind of hard to tell between Alan being, well, Alan, and the general lack of other communication. Brian's eyes had gone wide. Dude, okay, like, I just had a really weird thought, but, like, now it won't leave me alone. Is it a Demi thing? No, dude, that's why it's weird. But, like, how do they have sex? He wondered. Carefully, came a rumbling voice from behind them. Both Daniel and Brian jumped. Brian flushed red as a lobster. The Hulk chuckled like a thunderstorm and put his heavy, heavy hands on their shoulders. Northbound, he said, and steered them towards the carnation red northbound train, ready and waiting as passengers embarked. Daniel had been on intercity trains only twice before, once from Tucson to L.A. and once from L.A. to San Francisco. They generally didn't make stops for anything with less than 10,000 people, but the SF northbound catered to farmers, scientists, and park services of Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, and so made more remote stops than any of the others. It was, in fact, the only way to reach much of Northern California, unless you had several very good pairs of walking shoes and a lot of spare time. The trains themselves were sleek arrows of aluminum, painted in bright colors so that, when viewed from long distances, they appeared as streaks of color whizzing across the landscape. Their interiors were comfortably kitted out for long or short journeys. There were two wide seats on either side of a center aisle, each with its own window, outlet, fold-out desk, and footrest. The seats could recline to something like a 30-degree angle, perfectly comfortable for sleeping considering the memory foam under the soft upholstery, and still not squash the legs of the person sitting behind, since reclining in the chair also raised it a proportional amount off the floor. Most inner-city trains were 17 to 30 cars long, each being... <sighs> Fucking fuck. Lost my place. Sorry. Each car being about 40 feet in length, although some, usually the East Coast Crescent trains, could have as many as 50 cars. The magnetic rail system was immensely efficient and also incredibly smooth, due to the fact that the train was not actually touching the track. Energy collected while braking was used to accelerate the train back up to speed. Net energy consumption on your average intercity train was somewhere between 20 and 30 kilowatts per hour per car, which was especially impressive given that the average cruising speed was somewhere around 100 miles an hour, with the long hauls across the flat Midwest topping out at 230. This train, skirting the boundary between mountains and coastline, would likely never go above 90. Both of Daniel's previous trips on inner-city trains had been nerve-wracking experiences. He couldn't help but do the math on the amount of force his body would be subject to if the cr train crashed. It had come out to something like half a million newtons. Almost a thousand g's. More than enough to kill him ten times over. He would be chunky salsa on the wall with forces that incredibly large. The trains didn't even have seat belts because in laboratory testing all they had served to do was cut people up into little pieces before they splattered on the wall. He'd seen videos of the crash test dummies being ripped apart in excruciating slow motion. It hadn't helped that Daniel had done the math and watched the videos while on the train to L.A. The Hulk steered them on board and then to two empty seats next to each other. Brian and Daniel sat next to each other while the Hulk took up both seats across the aisle. I fucking hate trains. Daniel cursed under his breath. With everything he'd been through in the past 48 hours, the added stress of hurtling out of civilization at speeds quick enough to turn you into pudding if something went wrong was starting to make it hard to breathe. Unbidden, he wondered how much more stress he could take before his body started crapping out on him. A few minutes later, the train pulled out, moving slowly at first until its entire length had cleared the station, at which point it made for top speed with a sound like a steel orchestra tuning up 
and an invisible hand of force pushing all the passengers into their seats. Daniel could feel it crushing his ribcage and had to shut his eyes, focusing on breathing, trying not to imagine the walls of the tunnel blurring outside the window, trying not to think about what would happen to his sadly squishy little body if it hit the seat in front of him at 90 miles an hour, trying not to grip the armrests in white-knuckled claws of anxiety, and failing on all counts. Dude, Brian said softly, are you okay? Daniel shook his head. I fucking hate trains, man. His voice was strained. I still have a thing of chips in my pocket. You want it? No. Okay, uh, is there anything I can do to, like, help? Just talk about anything other than us crashing, Daniel said. The train was finally up to speed, and the force pushing him into his seat had eased off. Breathing was a little easier, but his head was still full of damning numbers and the terror of the void. Okay, uh, okay, this is like, don't think about pink elephants. Um, right, let's see. So, what happened while you were gone? Um, not much, really. Uh, Julie had her baby shower. There was cake, but it was kind of shitty anyway. Um, they're finally fixing the damn Coke machine so it won't buzz anymore. Although they haven't actually done it yet, and if I had a quarter for every time they said they were going to fix that damn thing and didn't, I'd be fucking rich. Is this helping at all? Daniel nodded carefully, avoiding setting off his head injuries. Um, so... I guess I, uh... I asked out Robin. She... <laughs> yeah. She said sure. So, I guess you were right about that one. He paused. Hey, so, I have a shitload of music on my phone. It's mostly all bitcore and, and video game music, but if you don't have your own music with you, you can borrow mine. Would that help? Anything helps, Brian. There was a little scuffling as Brian rooted out his headphones and got his phone in order to play music. Here you go, he said. Daniel cracked open an eye, careful to avoid looking at the window. He peeled his hands off the armrests and took the preferred phone and earbuds. The music drowned out some of the howl of air outside the train, and if he closed his eyes he could just about pretend he was sitting in his own living room on a windy day. Thanks, Brian, he muttered. He was dirt tired, he realized. Still, there would be no sleeping on the train. If he was going to die, he wanted to at least see it coming. It was a long hour, but the music did help, and as long as he kept his eyes closed to the scenery whipping past the window once they'd emerged from the city tunnels, he could keep himself under control. It seemed an eternity later when the train finally began to break, the invisible hand of force now trying to drag Daniel out of his seat. He just about lost it then, unable to breathe, clutching the seat for dear life and knowing it wouldn't do him any good if the train's deceleration took a turn for the worse. Finally, though, the train came to a complete and gentle stop, and Daniel was left gasping and trembling in his seat, Brian's chipper music still blaring in his ears. With shaking hands, he somehow managed to take the earbuds out. His eyes, long closed, were blurry when he opened them to look around. He rubbed them angrily and tried again. The Hulk was already standing, parting the sea of humanity with his mountainous bulk. Brian was looking between him and Daniel like a dog unsure whether to attend to his master or his injured puppy. Daniel levered himself to his feet, making Brian's choice rather easier. The purple-haired coder helped Daniel out into the aisle, both of them trailing in the wake of the Hulk. Are you okay? Brian asked. Daniel took in a deep breath as they stepped off the train. Yeah, he sighed. I think so. I just fucking hate trains. No kidding, said Brian. Can I get my phone back? Oh, right. 
Daniel handed it over. The shaking was already subsiding. Being out in the open air was helpful. So was moving at slightly less than Mach 1. Where are we going? Brian asked the Hulk. The train station was all but deserted. Clearly the majority of passengers were heading farther north, probably onto Portland or Seattle. Stick close, was all the Hulk said. Ever get the feeling you're being kidnapped? Brian grumbled to Daniel. Sometimes, yeah. And Daniel answered, making every effort not to think about guns and what they could do to a person's head. The train station was above ground, surrounded on all sides by thick pine forest. In the distance, the snow-capped peaks of the Sierra Nevadas were visible, peeking over the lush canopy. Once they had walked out from under the bright lights of the station, the sky stretched out glittering above them. Daniel paused a moment to catch his breath, staring up at the sky. The band of the Milky Way swept overhead, dotted with brighter stars and partially obscured by thin, high clouds. The moon hadn't yet risen, but some bright planet was hovering on the western horizon, shining clear and steady amidst the twinkling stars. At Daniel's shoulder, Brian let out a breath. Damn, he said. Daniel nodded. Easy to forget what it looks like, he commented. Break your necks like that, the Hulk told them. Long way to go yet. Daniel shook himself and looked at his more immediate surroundings. The Hulk was standing by a squat electric car, parked at the head of a dirt road that wound off into the looming conifers. Where the hell are we going? Brian demanded, exasperated. Get in, the Hulk said, squeezing himself into the driver's seat. Brian and Daniel glanced at each other. We could always get back on the train. Brian said. With expert timing, the train roared off into the night, leaving silence and turbulent air behind it. Brian watched it go, scowling. Guess we don't have much of a choice, Daniel said. Ah, oh, fuck that, Brian said. I'm staying here. Another train will come southbound and we'll go the fuck home. I'm not getting in a car with that guy and driving off into the fucking boonies never to be heard from again. He's not going to kill us, Brian. How the fuck do you know? Daniel's reply stalled on his tongue. How did he know? He found that he had exactly no reason to trust either Alan or the Hulk other than Minami's word that they were trustworthy, and even that had been iffy at best. I, I don't, he admitted. But come on, dude, he wouldn't... Drive us out into the middle of nowhere and murder us with a hammer? Cause I think he actually might. Dude, let's get the fuck out of here while we still can. Why didn't you think of this back in San Fran? Cause I didn't know he was gonna drive us out into the fucking boonies back in San Fran. I'm serious, dude. This is no good. I'm not getting in a car with that guy. No way. I've seen people who want to kill me, Brian. He's not one of them. Yeah, but you don't know that. The Hulk rolled down the window with a face like a thunderstorm. Come on, he said. Don't have all night. Dylan? Daniel called. Are you going to murder us? Brian buried his face in his hands, moaning. The Hulk chuckled. <laughs> Trust me, kid. If I was going to murder you, there are ways that don't involve getting squashed into a tissue box with wheels. Also, I'd have done it ten minutes ago. Get in the car, kids. Promise I'm not gonna murder you tonight. That doesn't make me feel any better, Brian said. Come on, dude, Daniel told him. Even if we ran, we wouldn't be able to get very far. Best case scenario, we get in the car and he doesn't kill us. Worst case scenario, we don't get in the car and he kills us anyway. I mean, look around, dude. There's no witnesses. Brian pointed at a camera, nestled in a corner like a silver bat. Uh, no, about 10,000 witnesses, right there. He then pointed at the dark and looming woods. And over there, zero. 
Dude, they'll never find our bodies. With a huge sigh, the Hulk pried himself out of the car again and lumbered over to the arguing coders. He put a heavy hand on each of their shoulders and leaned down to look Brian in the eyes. Look, Purple, you're making this tougher than it needs to be. Somebody's trying to kill your buddy here, and I'm trying not to let that happen. Because I'm a nice guy like that. So you can wait around here for the next train and take your chances with the motherfuckers who put a gun to your buddy's head. Or you can get in the car with me and shut your damn mouth. Got it? Daniel's jaw clenched. He spoke quietly, hoarsely, the words heavy on his tongue. How do you know they put a gun to my head? he asked. The Hulk turned his head to look at Daniel with the same slow smoothness the eagle on the hill exhibited and fixed him with a glare almost as disconcerting. I know a lot of things, he rumbled. Alan knows more. Hasn't told me much because the house is bugged all to hell. Which is why we're out here. Which is why you should get in the damn car. I'll make you kids dinner. We'll have a party. Fuck, fuck, fuck! Brian was hissing under his breath. The hell are you crying about? The Hulk asked. Brian pointed. Headlights, 